Welcome to Economics and Beyond. I'm Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with Arjun Jyadev, who I'm pleased to say is a senior economist at INET and a professor of economics at the Arjun Premji University in Bangalore, India. We're also here with Achal Prabala, who is a fellow at the Shuttleworth Foundation and the head of the Axis IBSA project there in India. Thank you both, gentlemen. I, I've read your articles in Mint, Live Mint. I've read your articles in the uh, Project Syndicate. I feel like you're dealing with very, very important problems. And, uh, and my audience and I are very, very curious about your insights because you're uh, regarding India, you're both based in India. And I, and I thank you for joining us. This is a, we need to shed light on all of the places that are important in the world. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Rob. So here we, here we uh, are at the end of May, 28th of May. We have this global pandemic. I, I, it is hard to be uh, jovial or humorous about such a thing. But I, I do make the joke that precisely at the time that all humans are asked to wear a mask, we are unmasking the flaws in the economic and social organization paradigm that we've lived by for the last 40 years. How to each of you experience this violent and, and dreadful tragedy and what do you see? What do you see that is being done well that gives you encouragement? What do you see as missing that you would recommend? What 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 creates fear within your spirit when you see dreadful things taking place? So I'll ask I'll ask each of you. Let's start with Arjun. Sure. What, how do you see the pandemic and its and the challenge that it presents? So thanks, Rob. I mean, uh, I like the phrasing unmasking of, uh, uh, you know, the, the paradigms that we've lived in. Um, I, you know, there is, they say that this particular virus uh, exposes the, uh, you know, the weaknesses in that already exist in, in the human body. But I think that's true as much of the body politic. Um, and I think across the world, we're seeing, uh, you know, Tearing along familiar fault lines, and uh, you know, my experience in India has been uh, that this has really exposed some of the really uh, horrendous fault lines that we've um, we've seen in India, specifically on the way that we have uh, dual tracks of uh, life and death in this country. I suppose this is the case all over the world, but the way that we have um, our responses and our um, general sense of uh, responsibility, civic duty seem to be completely divergent. And the pandemic, by virtue of making uh, sure that everybody is under threat, has exposed really uh, this underbelly. So just for example, um, we are now in India in the 68th day of lockdown. And um, uh, we've, we've seen possibly the most horrendous uh, internal migration that has been there since um, since we had partition. Uh, and day after day, we see horror stories about uh, people having to walk home, whereas, uh, and walk home meaning 1,200 kilometers, they're given trains, uh, trains get lost. It's, uh, it's both a huge amount of malevolence and incompetence when it comes to the poor. The rich are hiding for the moment, uh, and uh, we can't hide very much longer. So we're going to see uh, that play out in the next few uh, uh, weeks and months. Uh, so I think that there are many, many things that are, we can explore further, but just by way of um, putting the broad canvas, I think it has exposed these dual tracks and our response thus far has not been promising uh, with respect to handling this in a collective way, which uh, really we have to be. Yeah, Achal, how about yourself? How do you, how do you see what's on what's on the horizon? What, where where do we have to address things, and where are we lacking? Thank you, Rob. Uh, 
Uh, much like Arjun, I think uh, I live in India. We both live in Bangalore in South India, which is a relatively prosperous city uh, with a relatively young demographic. I, I, the thing that's been possibly the most heartbreaking in the last three months has been to see uh, not, unfortunately, what's happening directly around the coronavirus pandemic, but to see the thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who have no safety net whatsoever, who are completely at the mercy of a daily wage, who uh, are being denied that daily wage, who are being denied food, uh, who are being denied basic shelter in the places that they work in, making these treks back home, uh, starving along the way, some of them dying along the way. It's impossible to watch without bursting into tears. It is a, a horrendous tragedy. And what it underscores is the callousness of the Indian state. We do have welfare programs. The BJP, the party that's in power in India, despite being uh, uh, a politically right-wing party, uh, cannot uh, undo the welfare schemes that were put in place uh, prior to their rule. And so we have a few, not enough, welfare schemes in place around uh, uh, basic employment, uh, around food security. Very few of those are, are accessible to migrant workers when they're away from their villages, their homes, their states. And, and it has exposed the absurd callousness by which the Indian state machinery treats uh, people who are uh, literally at the bottom of the economic ladder in this country. Uh, and I think that's been extremely hard to watch. But what's also been hard to watch is how uh, the BJP and the ruling party has brought every pre-existing prejudice that it has had uh, over the last several decades of its existence somehow into the pandemic. Um, so very early on in the pandemic, uh, the BJP targeted a group of Muslim scholars who met in Delhi and identified and then shamed them publicly as being somehow, uh, 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 as, as somehow creating a super spreader event uh, for COVID-19. And uh, that quickly turned into the country's pre-existing prejudices uh, and turned those prejudices on, which meant that in the first few weeks of our response to the pandemic, the country was mainly interested in blaming a very small group of Muslim scholars who were among several other people who had been inadvertently caught up in uh, the, the mass chaos that the uh, pandemic response created. Uh, and so I'm I'm almost I'm almost stupefied, but but almost uh, admiring of how the BJP has managed to bring uh, every fault of its from the past few decades into this pandemic, uh, completely distracting us from the essential work that needs to be done, not just to uh, crest the wave of the coronavirus, but to address all of the underlying problems that is exposed in the way that we uh, treat the most vulnerable people in this country. So it's been difficult to watch. Wow. Arjun, uh, the two of you wrote an article recently about what you might call the, the, the dilemmas, might be a nice way of saying it, but, but the potential damage of allowing intellectual property rights in the pharmaceutical industry to prevent a broad-based response to the pandemic, providing vaccines and, and other medicines. You compare that to the flu vaccine and to Jonas Salk and describe to me and to our audience, what what is it that you are, are seeing as what you might call the failing of the current system? Thanks, Rob. Yes. So just as uh, background uh, to uh, to this. So Achal and I have known each other for, for decades and um, we went our own uh, separate ways and did many things. I, I did economics, Achal did law. And uh, many years ago, we came back and found we had a common interest in trying to understand how we should think about this uh, intellectual property system specifically with regard to the question of uh, medicines. And we've been working on it uh, on and off ever since, sometimes uh, uh, with Joe Stiglitz, uh, uh, who is 
um, you know, my, my postdoc advisor. And so uh, what, by way of background, I think it's important to, to understand that the intellectual property regime is not a sort of natural God-given thing, but something that was created explicitly in the last 20, 30 years in order to push particular advantages that richer countries had, specifically within the pharmaceutical uh, industry. And it's been an extremely destructive system uh, globally uh, in terms of purely of lives, uh, but also in terms of destroying countries' indigenous capacity to respond to public health emergencies and so on. India has a particular uh, interesting history in all of this because uh, India um, in 1970 actually uh, banned uh, any intellectual property rights in medicines. And as a result, we had an indigenous industry of uh, generic medicines, which has its own quite uh, incredible history. They're the kind of, because of um, uh, the country's uh, generic industry, uh, South, uh, Southern African countries and South Africa in particular, and Achal will probably have a lot more to say about this, was able to benefit from much lower prices. So we've been spending a lot of time on this. But stepping back a bit, Rob, I think the really interesting thing is that um, throughout the history of public health and medicine, there have been many, many innovations and many, many things that people have done without the, the requirement for and use of intellectual property. Uh, and of course, the classic example is Jonas Salk, but there've been many, many things that people have done which have been supported publicly through things like the National Institute of Health or through um, universities, which have then been taken up uh, by uh, private companies and been, uh, and the commons, the knowledge commons have, have, have uh, therefore been enclosed and this has become an extremely destructive system globally and so uh, we've been writing many many uh, responses to to this including what you can do differently and we, we're not of course the only ones there have been many kind of thoughts around this uh, advanced market commitments um, prizes over patents uh, uh, making clinical trials um, uh, publicly funded for example dean baker has written a lot about these kind of things uh, but I think what is interesting for us as uh, economists and lawyers is that we have all these interesting ways in which people are actually doing um, innovative things, uh, uh, which does not involve uh, uh, patents and intellectual property rights, and that we ought to be supporting these kind of uh, endeavors far more than we are. And that was the motivation for writing uh, much of this. And Achal may have something more to say about that. Sure. Acho? Yeah, uh, no, certainly I do. Uh, uh, look, I think I, I, I've worked as an activist now for about 18 years, and I've been working on access to medicines since then. I began getting interested in it uh, at exactly the time that the AIDS crisis in the developing world uh, spurred and actually created the access to medicines movement. And so at the turn of the century or the millennium, there was uh, the confluence of two things that, that created uh, both uh, tragic circumstances as well as uh, a, a, a wonderful activism that uh, has had far-reaching effects into the present day, which was uh, the creation of the WTO in the late 1990s and uh, a certain uh, formalization of a global intellectual property rights that were tied to the trade regime and trading rules, and therefore given a set of teeth that, that bit much harder than they'd ever done before. Uh, but that uh, confluence uh, consisted of two things, not just the globalization of trade, but also uh, the, the emergence of countries in sub-Saharan South Africa, for instance, especially South Africa, as being the global centers of the HIV AIDS epidemic. We thought of that as being something that was restricted to Europe and North America in the 1980s because of what we heard. Uh, but by the 1990s, it had shifted uh, to countries that were far poorer. And, and what they found was they were in an acute crisis of affordability. The, uh, the, this was a very strange situation. There were, there were cures in the sense that there were drugs to treat HIV AIDS, to turn it from a death sentence into a chronic condition like diabetes. So something unremarkable. Uh, you could 
you know, from being uh, the the cause of so much hysteria, HIV and AIDS has suddenly become, uh, had the potential to become something unremarkable, except that it couldn't quite be that way in South Africa because uh, the drugs cost $10,000 a year at the time and uh, for poor countries with uh, per capita incomes that were several times lower than that, it was obviously unaffordable either for individuals or for the state. To, to do anything with that solution. Uh, and, and this seemed particularly unjust and, 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 partic- and a particularly cruel metaphor for a kind of emerging neoliberal uh, economics at that time that you had a cure, you simply couldn't afford it. Uh, and, and that's how I started off uh, doing this work. Um, the AIDS activists of the time, by the way, did really create the template that then worked to solve access to medicines across a range of diseases, from cancers to hepatitis C. Uh, It moved from being a third world activist cause into becoming a first world concern. I I worked on a campaign in the UK to uh, gain access to drugs for cystic fibrosis. Uh, During the Democratic primary campaign, there was not a day that went by when uh, Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren did not talk about measures to rein in drug pricing. Uh, And all of that, actually, the template for this activism and the spotlight on these unjustified and frequently uh, just outrightly unjust Uh, private monopolies that pharmaceutical companies held on life-saving medicines, Uh, the template for that activism uh, really did come uh, from South Africa uh, in the early aughts. And I think one of the things that's been uh, welcome for me in the coronavirus pandemic is that in the past, we used to think of access as an afterthought. Uh, The focus was always on getting a drug, a cure, a treatment or a vaccine out. And then the idea was, let's let's think about how to get access uh, to this vaccine for poor people. So with AIDS drugs, it took 10 years after the AIDS drugs were developed for them to reach the places that they were needed the most. Uh, we have uh, cases with vaccines, such as the uh, pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, which is um, uh, a very effective vaccine against pneumonia. Uh, which is seemingly taking an infinite time to get to India because we simply can't afford it even today. And so there are 127,000 deaths a year from uh, a lack of vaccination uh, to this completely preventable disease. So what's happening in this pandemic is that many of the people who are are thinking about this, uh, both at the WHO and elsewhere, activists such as myself, are thinking about this together. We're thinking about developing treatments and vaccines, as well as how to have access to them at the same time. And it's for a couple of reasons. I think one, uh, there is this is uh, universal in a way that AIDS was not, or that uh, pneumonia is not, or that another uh, major public health problem like tuberculosis is not. And it's forcing us to understand that the health of uh, each of us is directly connected to the health of all of us and access therefore is an integral part of the solution. Even a nationalist solution necessarily needs to build in global access to whatever cures that emerge uh, for COVID-19 in order for it to work. Uh, And so that's a welcome change. I think that what we're trying to do now is to see how we can effectively apply the lessons from 40 years of human history, uh, lessons that were hard and tragic, uh, battles that were hard fought and won on the bodies of people who succumbed to these diseases, how we can apply those lessons in a way where we don't treat this as an anomaly. I think that there is a danger in treating the coronavirus pandemic as an anomaly to which the response is also an anomaly, uh, after which we then go back to doing things as usual. And and I think that to the extent that, uh, I think there are two problems here. I think that the first problem is in terms of our access to medicines and vaccines, to be able to to carve out an effective solution uh, to exit this pandemic whenever they emerge. Uh, But I think that the second problem here is to not treat this situation as anomalous and to treat it as uh, uh, 
part of a historical continuum which we must learn from in order to change some of the structures we have to respond to pandemics like this so that we can have a different future uh, rather than the same old past. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, uh, I guess I want to, I, th I think you guys have made a very clear argument and, and it's fascinating. Uh, Achala, you, you work in South Africa, India, and Brazil, from my understanding. Is that correct? I do. Yes, that's right. I work in all three countries. Yes. And in Brazil, my uh, closest friend from my graduate school years and an INET board member is Arminio Fraga, the f former central bank governor. And uh, the sense that I get from he and his family members is that things are very, very dire in, in Brazil right now, that this is... Uh, a very, very daunting challenge to their the fabric of their social organization. Uh, you know, I think that Brazil has had uh, compounded tragedy upon tragedy over the last couple of years. Uh, they've had a very, very contested and difficult election. They had uh, a, a whole a series of austerity measures even prior to the election that hobbled the state's ability to respond to poverty and inequality in the country, which were, I, I, I do think, uh, you know, however one evaluates uh, the the reign of the Workers' Party, the PT, the, the key focus of PT for uh, uh, more than a decade from the late 1990s uh, uh, until uh, uh, 2013 or 14, and I think that this particular crisis, I, I, I've been writing a little bit uh, around around the, Brazil, the Brazil, Brazilian response to the coronavirus pandemic, um, and I, I work with several colleagues there. I think that the, the human tragedy of this is unfolding in ways that we don't even understand. When I was working on um, uh, a couple of pieces about two weeks, uh, two and a half weeks ago, the death toll stood at 5,000 people, and, and, and today, just in that very short space of time since we wrote the piece, the death toll is over 25,000. Um, the number of doctors infected is going up, the number of uh, medical personnel uh, infected and uh, infected, mortally infected with the coronavirus is going up. Uh, the social fabric of the country is being torn apart, not in the least by the destructive encouragement of uh, Jair Bolsonaro, the president of Brazil, uh, to be, for Brazilians to simply somehow ignore this pandemic and to to sort of let it pass and to continue to indulge in uh, his favorite pastime, which he sees as being key to his survival, which is economic activity, to keep the economy going uh, at the cost of uh, uh, now it seems clearly thousands and thousands of lives. So. I, I think that the, 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 the tragedy is going to unfold in ways that we don't even understand. But I want to point out in the context of Brazil, something that I think people don't fully understand is that the classification of the country as a middle income, as an upper middle income country, in fact, has hurt it immeasurably. When you look at the um, uh, economic demographics of Brazil, uh, Brazil is a country with a majority of poor people and a minority of rich people. And uh, the truth is that for all kinds of uh, purposes of charity and concessions made by pharmaceutical companies around the world, uh, it's middle income countries, those countries that are unfortunately rife with income inequality, uh, typically Latin American countries, uh, some, of, some countries in the form of Soviet Union, uh, North African countries that are in the worst position possible. So, uh, uh, if I may, there's uh, an example uh, with one of the first treatments that was approved by the U.S. Uh, Food and Drug Administration uh, to treat the coronavirus pandemic, uh, which is, which is I, I, I think, an illustrative example of how access initiatives fail, and particularly fail countries like Brazil. So Remdesivir is an antiviral drug that was approved by the U.S. FDA. Uh, it's not a, a hugely important drug in itself, but it's a drug that holds potential for further research as well as for use in combination with other drugs. And so there are multiple trials along the way. Uh, 
Uh, Remdesivir is the monopoly property of Gilead, a pharmaceutical uh, multinational giant, which has uh, several patents in force for the next 20 years. Uh, Gilead announced uh, an access agreement. They signed deals with five Indian companies to produce the drug and export it to 127 of the poorest countries in the world. And that got a lot of press. Now, what didn't get a lot of press is that Gilead uh, excludes about half the world, the 4 billion people, from its access agreement, uh, every rich country and every middle-income country. So there's not a single country in Latin America that um, can get access to this drug at a discounted price. The Brazilian health system, which is strained, which has had its budgets frozen is effectively for the last five or six years, uh, has to face a bill of $4,500 per 10-day course of remdesivir uh, when and should it want to use this. While Gilead itself, without having sold yet a single pill, a single vial of remdesivir, has seen uh, its market capitalization increase by several billions of dollars in the last two months. Um, while at the same time donating its entire stockpile of remdesivir to the U.S. government for use in the pandemic uh, for free, right? So uh, it's allowed the poorest countries in the world to make it with zero royalty. It is uh, donating its uh, stockpiles of remdesivir to the richest country in the world for absolutely nothing. And it's charging an absurd price to every single country in between. What a mess. And uh, how would I say, those, those who choose to deify the marketplace had better ask, start asking questions uh, with, with outcomes like that. That's, that's just not, what may I call, humanly justified in any way, shape, or form. Let, let me uh, shift the focus now. You both live in India. And... Let, let's talk about when when I imagine a place like America using its fiscal capacity or Great Britain, there's just a tremendous, we might call, uh, possibility or, or capability to respond to a disaster. But in a place like India, where you have high incidence of many diseases, before and unrelated to the coronavirus, and you have lots of poverty and you're at a different stage of development, the question, the question I ask is, how can you mobilize the resources? How can you devote the resources? How can you acquire the resources to embrace this challenge? As, you know, how we say, given its severity and what, what is warranted, for the humanity of India? This, so, Rob, I think this is a, a great question. Um, just to link up to what we had spoken about before, I think it's an interesting thing that, you know, um, the three uh, uh, maybe outstanding authoritarian figures, Trump, Bolsonaro, and Modi, uh, have all been found uh, wanting with respect to responses. And I'd like to say a little bit about India's overall um, response and the fiscal front. Um, what really we've seen another unmasking here is just a simple, uh, complete uh, uh, inadequacy of responses by the uh, central government. And it extends quite extensively for the fiscal response. About two weeks ago, Modi uh, was on um, television with one of his 8 p.m. addresses, which of course fills most of us with fear because we have no idea what, what's going to happen. And he announced quite grandiosely that India was going to undertake a 10% of GDP stimulus. And everyone was pleased because clearly India has been going through a very bad period even prior to the pandemic. And the pandemic uh, was wiping out about $5 billion a day of activity. Um, it wasn't, we don't have a social safety net, et cetera. So people were excited about this 10% of GDP figure. And then in the next day or two, when the details came out, it became clear that this was uh, nothing of the sort, that uh, in fact, they were counting all kinds of things like the uh, central bank support, contingent liability support that had already been promised uh, uh, earlier, the support um, uh, that was promised to, to farmers as well uh, was part of this uh, supposed new package. And when it came down to 
finally, where the, the amounts that were actually being pledged, uh, it was things like maybe uh, somewhere between 0.7 to 1% of GDP. So there was a clear, there's just clear inadequacy, uh, inadequacy and lack of capacity uh, uh, to think creatively on, on uh, you know, on the part of this government. Uh, having said that, there is the genuine question, do you have resources uh, that you can uh, garner? And there's two or three things that India does have, which uh, it's not really um, using. I, I wrote a piece on uh, how India can finance this, you know, some of its um, uh, required fiscal stimulus. So obviously, we are going to have to think of some level of monetization uh, of uh, the deficit, and that has been something that has been taboo, but I think increasingly we're going to have to just face up to that. Uh, there are particular sorts of um, uh, simple uh, things that we ought to be doing. Cutting uh, interest rates now will mean that our debt-to-GDP ratios are much more stable in the medium term, uh, and while that's happened, it's happened uh, very inadequately at the moment. Um, then there are very simple things. We have... Um, uh, what are called cesses here, you know, uh, dedicated funds to particular uh, uh, outcomes, and they've just not been used. The education cess, for example. So there are many ways in which the government should they have been, should they have had the capacity and the bureaucratic capacity to quite easily shift a certain uh, per, uh, percentage of GDP into this kind of um, uh, essential uh, activity that we need. But we have not been able to pull that off. Um, and so it really is striking as to how the state governments are now being made to respond. Uh, and some of them have better capacity and are able to respond uh, both on the resource front and really on the uh, administrative front where others uh, are not. So, so uh, overall, it is a mess, but it's a mess of governance as much as it is a uh, mess of actually uh, capacity. And uh, uh, Chow, how do you how do you feel? Uh, which you might call, we're in a globalized world, and things are organized as a nation state. How do you see whether it's related to issues of climate or multilateral engagement? The development of India in relation to the disease, in relation to the needs, and what you might call the retrenchment of of multi multilateral concern. How do how does India fare in this context? So I think that there's a lot there, and um, so perhaps we can start. I mean, maybe I can unpack that by uh, by starting with what I think are the contradictions of India's coronavirus pandemic uh, response. When we think of countries uh, in Europe, especially uh, with well-functioning, uh, well-funded health systems, um, with uh, a, what I would describe only as a, as an overall stability. Um, I think that it's, it's it's a fragile stability because I've been working recently on cases where uh, many rich country governments like the UK's NHS, for instance, uh, cannot afford some of the new drugs that are coming to market around cancers and diseases like cystic fibrosis. So it's a fragile and, uh, 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 you know, not quite... Uh, not quite certain stability, but there is uh, there is evidence that there's a well-functioning system that by and large takes care of the public health needs of its population. We don't have that in India. And I think that one of the more, most tragic contradictions of uh, India's outsized response to the coronavirus pandemic is the question that Arjun and I tried to ask in our article for uh, Mint, which is a, a major financial newspaper in the country, um, which is how is it that we have been able to sit on, completely overlook uh, and accept what really is an unacceptable rate of completely preventable deaths. Uh, we're talking about 1,500 children a day in infant mortality uh, due to a lack of vaccinations. We're talking about 1,200 people a day who die due to tuberculosis. 
we're talking about uh, the millions, uh, literally this number is in the millions, who die as a result of complications, usually respiratory, connected to the disastrous uh, apocalyptic air quality in many parts of this country. Arjun and I are lucky to live in a city, Bangalore, which actually does not have the same kind of uh, industrial base or the farming base, and therefore not the same kind of... Uh, uh, horrendous air quality that uh, many parts of northern India get, uh, but we're nevertheless affected by it, and 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 we see it it affecting our country long before the coronavirus pandemic. And so one of the contradictions has been uh, a, a simple statistic, which is that more people die in one day of tuberculosis and a lack of vaccinations than have died in the last three months due to the coronavirus pandemic, and yet. We haven't done anything close to that. We've spent uh, up to uh, or lost up to $5 billion a day in our lockdown due to decreased economic activity. We've uh, spent an enormous amount of money coordinating very, very complex uh, state and federal institutions to enforce and maintain this lockdown. Um, and we've done all of that uh, for a, a pandemic which I think we are responding to primarily because it affects the rich. Now, this is not an argument for us not to respond to the pandemic. And I think we wanted to be clear about what we were trying to say as well. I think we, we support the government's response to the pandemic. We don't support the abject lack of planning that left millions of people destitute and dead as a result of it. But we support the effort that is being made in this pandemic. We just want to very clearly point out the glaring contradictions in this response. And as in terms of motivation, we are hard pressed to think of any reason other than that tuberculosis, bad air quality, these are things that primarily kill poor people. You know, of course, rich people are affected by air quality as well, right? But the way they're affected is that they have to cut short their evening walks in the park while wearing N95 masks. Um, and go back to their homes that are powered by very, very expensive air conditioners and air purifiers, of which there is a booming market in this country. Uh, tuberculosis is an infectious disease. It very rarely affects rich people because rich people don't live around people who have TB. You know, the way that TB uh, has played out in the world over the last few decades is that it has been completely eradicated in many Western countries, as a result of which many parts of Europe and the United States uh, they don't even you don't even take the the uh, vaccines against uh, uh, TB that we take the BCG vaccine. Um, we continue to take the vaccine here, but uh, the way it works in India is that between the rich and the poor, it's like the difference between Switzerland um, and uh, uh, and. Uh, a, a much poorer country uh, in terms of how TB affects us. So it's it's a huge part of the life of the modern Indian state, life and death from TB, uh, and it's no part of the life and uh, of the life of rich people within this country. And as a result of which, it's also almost no part of our fiscal response, our investment in, in, in curing and solving this disease. Um, so, so that is a glaring contradiction. At the same time, I think that we, we, I think we can effectively use what's happening in the coronavirus pandemic to address those issues because they do form a part of the broader vulnerability that will make the pandemic worse in general. Uh, and it's part of a larger group of uh, health factors that uh, I think could possibly get some attention now, given that we are now paying attention to public health for whatever reason, even the fact that it's rich people who are involved and vulnerable uh, in this situation. Um, so that, I think, to me, is the most important way in which we can use the pandemic to pay attention to the the, the broader issue that the pandemic addresses, which is public health in India and other poor countries with uh, similar situations, because we're not the only country where people are dying of diseases that can be cured, that we can invest in cures for uh, at, at much higher rates than the coronavirus pandemic. And so I think that this applies not just to us, but to, to many, many parts of uh, Asia, uh, Africa, uh, and some parts of Latin America. Uh, I think that 
uh, globally, uh, I, I have a, a, a friend and a colleague called Astra Taylor uh, who was talking about uh, this in, in, in relation to uh, the unmasking of the paradigm that you were talking about right at the outset of this conversation. Um, and she had a, a typically wise and witty thing to say, which is there are so many rules we see being dismantled or ignored in order to combat and exit from the pandemic. And it does make you wonder as to what those rules were for when they were there. If we have to ignore them in order to exit the pandemic, why did we need them in the first place? Uh, and for me, I think the most important way in which that uh, witticism manifests itself here is in terms of intellectual property. Uh, later today, I'm going to be part of a WHO event to uh, launch, to formally launch uh, a WHO COVID-19 technology pool for uh, not just uh, treatments and vaccines, but also diagnostics. Because again, since this is a new coronavirus, uh, even things like testing kits and protective equipment uh, come with intellectual property monopolies around them. Every pharmaceutical company CEO opposes this, but is having a hard time saying that publicly because uh, of the, uh, because suddenly now it's, it's, it's not poor people in India who are saying we need access to medicines. It's not poor people in a township uh, outside Johannesburg who are asking for access to medicines. It's old Etonians who need access to medicines. You know, it's, uh, it's the British cabinet. It's uh, uh, the leaderships of countries in like Spain and, and Canada and so on. Um, there's some very, very rich, I mean, I, 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 you know, I just have to say it, rich white people are really affected by the coronavirus pandemic and care just as much about access to medicines medicines uh, and treatments uh, as uh, the poor people who were asking for it uh, 20 years ago were in India and South Africa. And, and so pharmaceutical companies can't be as callous as they were. So all of them are now saying, well, we're not going to profit off this pandemic. We're not uh, ignoring the fact that they have actually already profited off this pandemic. The, there was a lot of attention paid to the increase in market capitalization of digital service firms, uh, including Amazon and, and many of the media companies. Uh, I think less attention has been paid to the ways in which the only other industry that's that's genuinely come out of this better is the pharmaceutical industry, uh, which has seen overall uh, an enormous rise in market capitalization uh, when you take the top you know, six or eight companies. Uh, so despite the fact that they've already profited off the pandemic, uh, they're all saying that they're not going to. At the same time, none of them have formally announced any renunciation of the very strict strictly enforced uh, intellectual property monopolies that they wield. Uh, they oppose the WHO COVID-19 technology pool, which would be a place where all monopoly ownership of uh, anything that can get us out of this pandemic will be pooled in order that pretty much anyone can then make those things, whether it's a vaccine or a, or a drug uh, or a test kit. Now, <laughs> it's... Uh, it, it is really astonishing, and I think that somebody should talk to them uh, publicly and more seriously about this uh, to be able to uh, uh, put them to the test, because either you're profiting from this or you're not. And if you're profiting from this, then you should face the consequences of it. And if you're not profiting from it, we should have a formal arrangement by which you can say so. And, and if we're not going to be enforcing intellectual property monopolies in a pandemic, as a necessary precondition to exit the pandemic, then I would love to know why we have to enforce those monopolies in order to uh, do everything else we do, which is survive cancer, which is survive hepatitis C, which is survive cystic fibrosis, uh, survive tuberculosis, or, or any other disease that we die of. Yeah, yeah it's almost as if... Um, what I, Arjun, you, you'll correct me if I get the economics wrong, but... The inelasticity of demand of a person who is ill allows predators to exploit. And we just we just can't have a system like this. There there's something, how would I say, more important than the inspiration for profit at stake here. And I I sense everybody feels it across the whole spectrum of health challenges and, and, and other things that are, are of essence. Let me, let me turn now. Many of the guests 
who have been on this podcast talk about climate as the thing that was haunting before the pandemic and fingers crossed after the vaccine and the other potential mitigating influences and remedies have been created on the horizon in a 10 to 15 year horizon, not, not much longer is a long gestation gestation transformation of the very structure of energy so that man can, can survive. And the reason I bring that to the table with the two of you is first, there's a quite a division among my guests between whether the climate initiative, which was gathering momentum prior to the pandemic, will be spurred on by what we've called tonight the unmasking, or or will it be what you might call diminished in intensity because we've used fiscal capacity at a very large level to fight the pandemic because global cooperation is breaking down, particularly between the United States and China, and because people are exhausted. And the idea of a large transformation is uh, daunting, and and maybe they want to be quiet for a while before they embrace the next challenge. On the other side of that, what you might call a macro Keynesian might see a a national and global program of energy transformation as a new source of aggregate demand and recovery and employment. And so I I don't know how you see this, but one thing I do know is every climate expert or leader that I have interviewed feels that the fulcrum of what will matter is how the intersection between development of India, given the scale of the size of the country, and transformation of energy in India. At the margin, they consider that the most important project. And obviously, given the level of development in India, it's a very, very, very hard thing to imagine them doing the public good for the world on their own without multilateral assistance. So with all of that context, how do you see the the horizon vis-a-vis energy transformation addressing climate in the country of India? Arjun, why don't you, why don't you start? Sure. So, so, Rob, you know, it's an interesting thing. Um, you know, we've had the plague, if you will, you know, the, the pandemic. Um, uh, last week, we had uh, a cyclone that came in through and really kind of um, one of the most powerful cyclones we've, we've had and flooded and kind of destroyed one of India's uh, major cities, Calcutta. And now we have uh, locusts which are coming in from, uh, from Africa, right? So these are the so-called biblical plagues, you know, the locust floods, plagues. And in some ways, maybe as someone said, you know, they're just symptoms of um, ecosystem collapse. We just keep repeating these as uh, some sort of collective memory of the last warning cries of, you know, some sort of collapsing civilization. And sometimes I think that, you know, all of these come together as warnings and this is what people have been worried about. Um, so we, India, you know, in this context, in the context of uh, climate change, obviously there are uh, two competing camps, one which says that uh, I think rightly and justly India should not be made to um, to pay for the fact that the carbon uh, bank has been has been uh, thieved and taken away by the West and maybe China to an extent. And there is, of course, the other camp, which is also right, which says that any sort of development plan cannot be um, innocent of uh, climate change. And in India, we know that there is absolutely no way that uh, 
development plans can can ignore climate change uh, and therefore i think there is a concerted effort among scientists and so on to think of different ways of of doing this which of course will mean uh, technological transfers uh, different sort of financing and so on i'd like to say a little bit though about the whole question about um, the financing of this transition and the worry about fiscal capacity um, you know it's it's true that we will have spent money on uh, on uh, the pandemic but i don't see the number itself you know let's say debt to gdp ratios grow by 20% 30% i'm not sure exactly what what the number is um what is the main concern that people have i think the main concern that people have is that it will in some ways use up the real resources that we have and uh, create inflation you know I've, a friend once said this uh, you know, better the economy run hot than the planet. And I feel like that is true, that we have to try to make sure that all our resources are maximized at the current moment. I don't see there, a prob- there to be a problem post the pandemic of uh, resource uh, unavailability, real resource unavailability. There are going to be people who are unemployed. There are going to be people and systems which have to be rethought. And so I actually see it as an opportunity globally, and of course, as well as in India, uh, to um, to rethink our ways. So uh, you said your guests had two kind of competing views. I'm sort of firmly in the view that this is actually an opportunity to think creatively and effectively about um, the transition, which must happen if we're going to survive as a species. Okay. Now, Chal, how do you uh, how do you see this challenge? <laughs> I would say this similar to, similarly to Arjun, but with some conditions attached. Uh, and I, I think let me just explain uh, what I mean. I, you know, I've been a public health activist, and I think that there are some ways in which, uh, in a country like India, uh, uh, even despite the global conversation around climate change, it can seem like a both distant thing and a thing that is far away in the future. Uh, it's it is for me. I think that there is a way in which we have. Uh, dire immediate effects of uh, energy consumption that are costing human lives. And I think that air pollution is one of the the most uh, vivid examples of how that's affecting us. I think the, the, the condition that I was going to talk about was to be able to cast efforts at future climate change uh, prevention and containment around uh, to cast that conversation as a question of saving human life. But not in the future, but in the present. You know, we have... Uh, uh, one of the consequences of, uh, of countries like China and India uh, deciding that they must do their own bit around carbon depletion to catch up with uh, three or four centuries of uh, work in the richer countries in the world has been the fact that it is certainly while helping their economies grow, has been costing enormous human lives within these countries as well. And and I think that uh, we don't pay enough attention to that fact. We don't publicize or uh, examine the number of millions of people in India that are being mortally affected by our energy consumption. And I think that a, a very, very good way to start without necessarily even using the term climate change would be a public health authority that is designated to save human lives in India that come at the cost of air pollution and air at bad air quality in the country. Uh, the regulations that we can design around that, the rules that we could put in place uh, to combat that, you know, whether it's incentivizing uh, electric vehicles, in, whether it's it's creating massive new investments and in infrastructure for public transport, uh, would be would go a long way in, in in terms of our larger, longer fight against climate change. But I do think that casting these uh, these these plans, I think, for it to be politically feasible, either for the government or even. Uh, expedient for any government, this one or even a more left-leaning one, to undertake 
I, I think to use the cost in immediate human lives in the present day as the best justification to start implementing these programs is, is a really good one. It would make sense at every level possible. And it's one that I'd support enormously and I think would make sense to uh, you know every voter in this country. And, and I'm surprised that, that, that we haven't started implementing programs uh, that use human life uh, as a basis to address climate change. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what, what do you see in the world? Um, you look at this tension between the United States and China and our capacity for having a collaborative global system is, uh, how I say, uh, it, it appears to me to be at risk. But I know that in India's relationship with China, there are some there are some other complexities, and I'm curious how you see the prospects for India in light of the breakdown of the relationship between the United States and China. Do either of you th see? Uh, how would I say? Uh, a, a dreadful scenario that relates to that, or is that not such a concern for people in India? Uh, I could start with uh, uh, <laughs> uh, perhaps uh, at the very moment, uh, India and China are engaged in a territorial standoff. So in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic, Indian soldiers and Chinese soldiers are beating each other up and shooting at each other in one remote corner of India over contested territory. Um, there's a long standing territorial dispute, which is it's just too slow burning to even care about. Uh, but they're in the middle of doing that right now. Um, Indian media is awash with uh, what I can only think of, what I can only term as completely delusional articles, which suggest somehow that uh, uh, the Indian government is going to turn India into a manufacturing base that will take advantage of uh, the United States and the world's uh, anger against China and its perceived inability to manufacture now uh, because of the coronavirus pandemic, uh, which is complete nonsense and, and and has been described as such, I think, by anyone uh, with a with with a working mind. Um, I think that the the larger question of of multilateral cooperation that you brought up, Rob, I think, is very important. Um, the uh, piece that. Uh, uh, Arjun and, and Joe uh, and I wrote together in uh, Project Syndicate uh, talks about the flu shot that we all take. So this is the shot that Americans take every year, that not as many Indians take every year, but is available to us to take every year. The newest version of that vaccine, it's called a quadrivalent vaccine. So it targets, I think, four different strains of uh, uh, the influenza virus. Um, that shot that is manufactured by uh, hundreds of companies around the world because there's no monopoly on it uh, is produced through collaborative research that uh, takes place every day through national monitoring laboratories in 110 countries around the world. And it's based out of a center, a very little known center at the WHO. It's called GISRS, the Global Influenza Surveillance and Response System um, in the WHO. Uh, so what they do is they monitor all these flu strains and then twice a year at the opening of the flu season in the Northern Hemisphere and in the Southern Hemisphere, they issue recommendations as to what strains should be included in that year's flu shot. Now, obviously, the flu shot, as we know, is not something that eliminates uh, your susceptibility to influenza. It merely reduces it by a substantial extent uh, to the extent that it is recommended by health systems almost everywhere in the world. Um, so what the WHO does is that it uses international cooperation, uh, a vast network of international cooperation to uh, uh, analyze on an ongoing basis of uh, flu data and uses that to create an open source uh, formula that then anyone can apply and uh, produce. Now, no country government is bound to follow the WHO's uh, recommendations, but invariably every one of them does, including the Center for Disease Control in the United States. 
Um, this is the model of multilateral cooperation that we have had. And incidentally, one other curious factoid about the flu vaccine is that, of course, the very first strains of the flu vaccine were developed by the very same Jonas Salk, uh, who uh, gave us the polio vaccine and who, of course, memorably said to Ed Morrow in an interview when asked why he didn't patent it and have a monopoly on the polio vaccine, uh, said, uh, I never thought of it, uh, I, it was a people's vaccine, uh, can you patent the sun? Uh, which really brings a tear to my eye even after all these years. Um, so the model of multi -cooper multilateral cooperation, it's, it's not even a fantasy that we have to imagine, and I think that's the point we were trying to make in that piece. This is how uh, one important part of the world already works. This is how it's worked since 1973, in fact, right? And uh, it's done a lot of good in the world. It works. There is a system in place to do it. We could replicate that and build on that, use that as a model uh, for not just uh, flu vaccines, but for pretty much every other form of uh, disease research and development that the world needs. We don't actually need to follow the model where everything, uh, every aspect of research is then divested uh, with no responsibility to a private corporation to bring to market. Um, so we have a system in the world that works. It's an important multilateral system. It has to work. And to the extent that the coronavirus pandemic increases multilateral cooperation, despite the United States' uh, um, recalcitrance to, to do so, uh, I think that could be one of the best outcomes of this. Not only the fact that each of us is individually interconnected in terms of our health affecting the other, but the fact that uh, the more that countries cooperate in this interdependence and in this, in this mutual feeling of solidarity, the better results we will come to, whether it's uh, uh, containing a pandemic or curing it. Hmm. Arjun, any thought? Um, you know, the question about uh, where, where India will be with respect to these, the, the global changes that are going on. So, yes, it is interesting. India's relationship with China has always been fraught uh, since the 60s, at least. And uh, it's seen itself as a rival, though it's never really, I think, measured up to that in the economic sphere. Um, it's hard to say, Rob. I, 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 you know, this, this is a world in which I think we're suddenly seeing a move to greater uh, nationalism and a certain belief that uh, the nation state has to be strengthened and that you see across the world. So you have these contradictory impulses. We do understand that the world requires global cooperation. Many of the responses have been uh, very national and nationalistic. India's, um, the new word that uh, is being bandied about is uh, self-reliance uh, in, uh, in India, which is, of course, uh, harkening back to 30, 40, 50 years ago. So uh, it's hard to say where India will uh, end up in all of this, whether at the end of 16, uh, 18 months, uh, we'll actually, uh, you know, try try to be much more um, reliant on our own supply chains or uh, whether, uh, you know, we'll return to the, to the earlier world uh, with respect to Chinese manufacturing. Um, so I, I, I wish I had more clarity on this, but I do think that's a, that's an axis on which uh, a lot will depend on the way we go forward. And my hope as, as uh, uh, you know, I have evinced in that article with Achal and Joe is that we actually think of the good parts about global integration and try to, to um, you know, promote those as opposed to going back to a nationalism, which is narrow, uh, inefficient, and probably uh, in the end, uh, self-destructive. Okay. Well, I want to thank you both. We've uh, explored a lot of terrain in the issue space. Your deep dives in the realm of healthcare and the systems that we create create incentives or disincentives to the protection of health and the context of India are all very important dimensions for those affiliated and interested in the Institute for New Economic Thinking to understand and to explore. I hope that both of you will uh, come back and see me again in a few months' time, because I, I think this is a work in progress. I think you're both quite a bit ahead of the curve. <laughs>
but there'll be new stimulants. There'll be new turns in the road. And I guess for right now, I want to thank you for steering our minds tonight. But I do hope to see you again soon. Thank you, Rob. Thank you very much, Rob, and thanks for everything. Thank you. We'll, we'll be in touch and uh, we'll, we'll be back together before too much time passes. Good night. It was a pleasure. And check out more from the Institute for New Economic Thinking at ineteconomics.org.